Thank you. Hi, hi, hi. All right, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the books I've written before I go into the top 10 Italians, but she said she's known me for years and I've been here. I w I'm an alumnus. Matter of fact, I, I went to Notre Dame High School over there and then I came here. So I tell people I've achieved a lot in life. I have crossed the street, which is basically <laughs> where I've come. Um, but this is the book that the handout you have is this is the table of contents, the Italian 100. Now this is a series of top 100 books that more than one publisher has done over the years, but I've done several of them. Now I'm going to show some of them to you. But the story behind this book is yeah, I was offered the opportunity to write it. Um, publishers and editors are notorious for trying to immediately link an Italian name with an Italian project. So they said, well, I had done several books for this company, and they said, Spignassi, hey, would you want to do the Italian 100? I said, sure. Long story short, my first list, my master list of Italian notables that I believed were worthy of consideration, 880 names. And I had to cut it to 100. Once I did, and the, that's the handout that you're looking at, I'll never forget. I came in here, this book came out in 98. I came in here in 97 with a list of those 100 names and walked up to a librarian and said, help me. Where do I find, long, again, long story short, the vast majority of this book was researched right here and on this floor. The stacks of the Marvin K. Peterson Library are extraordinary. I found things that I had uncovered in my research on the shelf. Rare books from the 16th century, renderings by doctors who had come up with something they discovered, botanists who had written. The books were here. Some were not in English. So I had a problem with that, and I kind of overlooked those. But the bottom line is that the, the resources here are extraordinary, and the bulk of my research for this book was done right here. And I just want to express enormous gratitude to the UNH and the library for being such a help with researching this book. Now, the Italian 100 are the 100 most influential figures in politics, culture, and science, all right? Now, a lot of, uh, many times I'll get asked, how could you include Mussolini? How could you include Lucky Luciano? And I said, I included them because these are not the greatest Italians. They are the influential Italians. Regardless of your views on Lucky Luciani and the mob, can't deny he's been influential regarding organized crime in the United States. Influence is the key word as to how we are to arrange these books. And the, the other books that exist, ranging from the Catholic 100, okay, to the Jewish 100, the Irish 100, the Scientific 100, the African American 100. They have an entire series of these books. And we are always, always told, focus on influence, not evaluation in terms of popularity, greatness, etc. Their achievements aren't always good. The people on these lists but you can't deny their influence. And that's, that's the thesis that we work with for these books. Now, um, Hanko mentioned that I also write for other companies. Um, I teach English Comp and Lit here, E105 and E110. I teach the occasional special topic course, one of which she mentioned, Writing for Publication, which was a very popular course. A lot of students want to write and want to be published and don't know how to go about getting an agent, getting a publisher, submitting to a publisher, sub, uh, editing manuscripts for submission. What's a proposal, okay? So I did that one here, and I do the occasional special topic course, as I mentioned two semesters ago, 
I did one on the literature and legacy of the Titanic, which was a very popular course. And it was based on my book, The Titanic for Dummies. I write the Four Dummies books, as well as the other nonfiction titles that I have on my bibliography. Um, this is the Titanic for Dummies. I also wrote Lost Books of the Bible. The Bible that you know is not the Bible that was originally conceived. And there were a lot of books that were rejected for inclusion in the Old and New Testament. And this book, I worked with a theologian from Loyola and who teaches on the lost books of the Bible. And my mind was opened to what was left out of the Bible as we know it, particularly the King James Version. And then I also wrote Native American history for dummies. And I worked with a, um, a full-blooded Choctaw who is the reclamation specialist at the Smithsonian. What a job. It's, it's, a, it's a heartbreaking job. Her job is whenever Native American bones are found anywhere in North America, she gets on a plane. She goes and collects the bones, brings them back to the Smithsonian, does DNA testing on them, confirms the tribe of the Native Americans that the bones belong to, and then the Smithsonian has a ceremony in which the bones are passed to the leader of the tribe, the current leader of the tribe, so that they can be buried on sacred burial ground. And because she's full-blooded Choctaw, this speaks to her. So working with her uh, really opened my eyes. Um, some of you saw me at SOAR. Do you remember what the SOAR when I talked about the um, common reed? this year when the emperor was divine, which is about Japanese internment camps. And, you know, the Native American slaughter, slavery, and Japanese internment camps, three black marks on American history. Um, and I learned a lot by working with her regarding Native American history. Um, so I do the dummies books. Um, I also do mainstream nonfiction. This was my only New York Times bestseller. John F. Kennedy Jr., a biography of JFK Jr. And you know something? It's the only reason it was a New York Times bestseller was because he died. His plane crashed into Long Island Sound. And it was definitely pilot error, okay? And in a month, 80,000 copies of this book sold. The book had been out for two and a half years and sold 9,000 copies. In America, timing is everything. So I've had one New York Times bestseller through just a quirk of fate. Um, but once it was reported that his re remains were found, the demand for anything about JFK Jr. was extraordinary. And this is kind of like an illustrated scrapbook with photos and biographical material and so forth. For those of you who are a little too young to remember him, he's the president of the assassinated president. He's the son of the assassinated president, John F. Kennedy. Uh, he was a writer and an editor uh, prior to his death. He created the magazine George, which was a combination of like Esquire and a political magazine, which was a brilliant magazine. And then he died. Um, my most recent book is this. Grover Cleveland's Rubber Jaw. It's a collection of very strange presidential trivia. Um, in fact, it's so strange that when I do TV interviews for this book, I won't talk about the LBJ or JFK chapters, mainly because of the nasty stuff that uh, are in those two chapters. I tell people, go read the book if you want to hear about it. Um, but I did a lot of research to find this information. It's all confirmed through authorized biographies and so forth. And my only novel was, so far as dialogues, and I teach this in my E110 course. It's a psychological thriller, and I teach it based on symbolism and metaphor and dialogue and narrative, and I teach how to, a novel is put together. And um, so that's what I do. I also have five books about Stephen King, three books about the Beatles, um, and pretty much
anything that interests me, I'll try and put a book together idea for, right? But half of my books, and this is what a lot of first-time writers aren't, aren't aware of, is that there is a secret list. Every publisher has a secret list. And that list is books looking for writers. Because people like to work with people they like, with people they trust, with people who have a history with them. So after I did several books for several publishers, every publishing company has ideas meetings where they come up with ideas for books. They don't wait for the author to send in an idea. In many cases, they come up with ideas. So basically, half of the books I've written were offered to me. And when a lot of unpublished writers hear that, they say, oh, how can I get in on that? Can't I be on the list where I get asked to write a book based on what they're interested in? It's, again, it's paying your dues. It's, it's having a track record. You can't just walk into the industry and immediately get deals and contracts. So I always say start small, keep submitting. Don't get upset by rejection if you're a writer and you want to be published because the rejection rate has skyrocketed in the last 10 years because of the collapse of the industries like housing. Remember when the housing industry went under? Publishing was right behind it. So now all the publishers are combining. And I just found out a couple months ago that Penguin combined with Random House. And we were all hoping that it would be called Random Penguin because that would be fun, but it's not. It's Penguin Random House. The Grover Cleveland book I just showed you, that's Penguin. My novel is Random House. So who do I work for now? And my agent doesn't know who to submit to. If he submits to Penguin and it gets turned down, does that mean the whole company has rejected me? Or can we go to re his attitude? Submit to everybody until they say no. So he just goes to Random House editors instead of Penguin House, Penguin editors, if we get rejected. So that's a little background on me, a little history on me. As I said, I teach composition and literature here. Um, and um, the 10 Italian figures I'm going to talk to you about are the top 10 in reverse order. I'm going to do a David Letterman, all right? And I'm going to start with Da Vinci, OK? You've all heard of Da Vinci. Now, <clears throat> Da Vinci's an interesting pick because he epitomizes influence. He used to start projects and not finish them. He used to have incomplete designs and drawings and manuscripts that he would end up never doing anything with. He would spend days and weeks writing in his notebook. And his notebooks, you may have heard of them, Da Vinci notebooks, Many claim, who aren't really aware of how it worked, that he invented the things that were in his notebook, which included, I'm going to read you a list, you're not going to believe this, Da Vinci's notebooks included designs for the airplane, the air conditioner, the oil lamp, the alarm clock, the printing press, the odometer, the pedometer, the magnetic compass, eyeglasses, the telescope, the differential transmission, the water turbine, the machine gun, the tank, an underwater diving suit, the life preserver, and the parachute. In fact, in his writings, he wrote, if a man have a tent made of linen, of which the apertures have all been stopped up, and it be 12 cubits across and 12 in depth, he will be able to throw himself down from any great height without sustaining any injury. And he was right. But the majority of these inventions came into being without the inventors being aware of da Vinci's notebooks. So ultimately, he had the genius, the inspiration, the brilliance to come up with these ideas but they were never acted on beyond drawing. And his notebooks were in mirror writing, by the way. You had to hold it up to a mirror to read it. And he wrote like that. And one wonders, just how crazy was he? How thin is the line between crazy and genius?
But he did design all of these things, never acted upon them, and ultimately became known as Michael Hart, uh, who teaches at Southern. He, um, he was my consultant on the top 100. Um, and he said, it is possible that Leonardo da Vinci was the most talented person who ever lived. That comes pretty close to being accurate, in my opinion. Um, his body of work was beyond imagination, okay? The Mona Lisa, most famous painting in the world. People write books about one painting. There's a very popular book out called The Annotated Mona Lisa, which actually deconstructs every, if we were in talking computer age, every pixel of the painting, geometrically, in terms of color, in terms of background, it's, it's a mind-boggling interpretation of the, of the painting, and it sells like crazy because people are fascinated by it. What's the second most famous painting in the world? Also one of his, The Last Supper. Okay, The Last Supper. There's an interesting anecdote about da Vinci. When he got the commission to do it, he would often sit and stare at the wall just stare. And people would say to him, Master, what are you doing? Make with the brushes. What, why are you doing? And he said, no, no, no. He said, a genius does his best work when he does nothing. I know what that means because there's a similar adage in terms regarding writing that writers, spouses, or partners have to understand that when we are sitting and staring out the window, we are working. And that was Da Vinci. That was Da Vinci. Um, he who loses sight, he who loses sight loses his view of the universe. Um, that was his thesis. The idea that sight and vision are the dominant way in which we absorb, understand, and metaphorically inhale the universe. Da Vinci was probably the definitive man of the Renaissance and he also was a ballistics expert. It's not enough, he did everything else. He also sent a job application um, to Lodovico who was the regent of Milan in which he said, um, most illustrious lord, in order to acquaint you with my secrets, Here's a list of what I can do for you. I have plans for bridges, very light and strong. When a place is besieged, I know how to cut off water from the trenches. I have plans for making a cannon, very convenient, easy to transport, and it will hurl small stones in the manner almost of hail. And where it is not possible to employ the cannon, I can supply catapults, traps, and other engines of wonderful efficacy. Though it's, this is considered the world's most unique job application because he was basically looking for a contract to make weaponry and bridges and cannons and so forth to help the military defend towns, cities, castles, etc. Leonardo was, now think about this, um, this was, uh, he was born in 1452, he died when he was 67, in 1519, but at that time he was gay, a vegetarian, an animal rights activist, and he dressed like a dandy every day, meticulously. He would buy birds in cages to set them free because he couldn't stand seeing caged birds. So da Vinci is one of the most influential Italians in world history, um, and he's number 10 on the list, and we're gonna move on to number nine. Any questions about da Vinci? Well, I'll take questions at the end. Uh, and by the way, just as an aside, believe it or not, I got asked a lot about the real Italian influence on the world after a certain movie came out. And the movie was My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Because in that movie, the father 
constantly reminds his children and his relatives that the Greeks were the most influential ethnic group in the history of the world. There is as of yet no Greek 100. That book is not written yet. And also, I'm not sure that if we researched Greek history that we would find 880 names worthy of inclusion for a master list to determine influence on the world. Yes, I am not demeaning Greek culture, society, politics, science at all. It was an enormous impact on the world. But if you're comparing the two, and it's not because my last name ends in a vowel, <laughs> but it seems like Italian, the Italian culture, the Italian people, the ethnic group of Italians has been more influential. Just the top 10 alone, you can't imagine living in a world without what they invented and designed. So, um, I still believe the Italians have been the most influential ethnic group. I won't say race because it's not a race, it's an ethnicity um, on, on the world. And we're going to move on to Michelangelo, who is number nine. Michelangelo was um, a sculptor, a painter, an architect, and he wrote. His nickname, or how he was described by people who knew him was Terribilita, which means terrible, you would think, but it means more furious, passionate, just that Italian fire burning in his soul and his heart. Terribilita, the passion of Michelangelo, the terrifying power of the inspired artist. Um, he essentially created some of the most memorable, most important sculptures in the history of the world. The Pieta, Mary holding the body of Jesus. David, David, that sculpture alone would have cemented his reputation if he had not gone on to do the Sistine Chapel and design St. Peter's Cathedral. This is one man. He did all that. And there's a really interesting story about David. You're all familiar with the statue of David. It's 13 and a half feet tall. He was hired because they, the, the powers that be, the operari, the Florence operari, the ones who controlled the money and would hire artists to sponsor them, they asked him if he could do something with this irregularly cut piece of marble. It's kind of oddly shaped and they didn't know what to do with it. They owned it because they commissioned trips to the mines to get marble for sculpture. So they asked Michelangelo, can you, can you do anything with this? And he said, absolutely. And he took the job and they signed the contract. Long story short, 30 months. It took him 30 months for which he got the equivalent of what would be $6,000 today, 400 florins, okay? $6,000, 30 months, 50 bucks a week to sculpt David. Now he knew that bureaucrats then are bureaucrats now and as will ever be. He knew that the politicians and the ones who had to sign off on the statue would give him a hard time. Primarily to assert their authority, to act like they're making a contribution. So it's unveiled and the politicians walk in and this one really obnoxious guy says, the nose is too big. This guy, right, is telling Michelangelo that the nose of David is too big. So Michelangelo, very modest, very humble, he said, yes, sir, yes, sir. And he climbs the ladder 15 feet up to, to David's head. And he takes out a hammer from his smock. And he starts tapping the nose, tap, 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 tap. Tap, 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 tap. 
and marble dust begins falling to the floor. And he keeps this up and he keeps this up and he keeps this up until finally he taps it one more time, doesn't look down at the, the crew and descends the ladder. He walks up to the guy and he said, now it's perfect. Now you've got it right. Now look at it. Yes, we will approve you getting paid. He had to do this on spec. Think about that. No money coming in for 30 months while he carved, while he sculpted the statue. Well, the rest of the story is that Michelangelo knew exactly what was going to happen. So in his palm, he had secreted a handful of marble dust. And when he climbed the ladder, all he did was touch the nose and let the dust fall to the floor. Didn't change anything. <laughs> and they signed off on his check or his money, so to speak. So he had um, the passion of, the, of, the, of genius, the passion of the inspired artist. And he also had, you know the way Georgia O'Keeffe kept painting the same door over and over and over. Michelangelo was really fixated on the Pieta. He was 89 when he died, and guess what he left behind? An unfinished Pieta. He had started yet another one. Because, not that he wasn't satisfied with the original, which is a, a classic piece of sculpture in world history, but he was just compulsively obsessed with the image of the crucified Christ in his mother's lap, in his mother's arms. So he did. He started another one. Like, and like O'Keefe, just kept doing it over and over and over. Um, the Sistine Chapel, um, he painted that. It's, it's 6,000 square feet and it has, you all know what it has, the book of Genesis, creation of Adam, creation of the world, drunkenness of Noah, etc. Um, he got, he signed a contract that he would paint it and it would be at his pace. There wasn't really a deadline. And he would also stand and stare until finally he began painting. The myth is that he painted on his back. Some of you may have heard that. Painted standing up. And he actually wrote a poem, I've grown a goiter. I've grown a goiter by dwelling in this den. My beard turns up to heaven. Because standing for months and months to paint the Sistine Chapel was such a burden on him that he ended up getting sick from it. His chest swelled from fluid or pressure or whatever, but he ultimately completed it. And then 22 years later, he went back to add one more thing to the wall behind the altar, the Last Judgment. And it's interesting because his mind at that point, he might have been somewhat depressed because there's an image of St. Bartholomew in the, in the Last Judgment with the skin of his face be having been flayed off, okay? He's in anguish. It wasn't until after Michelangelo died that art scholars realized it was Michelangelo's face on St. Bartholomew. He put himself as the one being flayed alive. Any way you twist and turn, the psychology of that is breathtaking. And yet no one knew, and he didn't tell anybody. Okay. And by the way, um, I'll move on in, in two seconds. I have something to read to you, which is completely relevant to Michelangelo, our Michelangelo talk. This is in today's paper, today's news. Sistine Chapel pollution levels threaten Michelangelo frescoes. Vatican may limit visitors. The head of the Vatican Museums has warned he will be forced to limit the number of visitors to the Sistine Chapel if its new air conditioning and air purification systems don't significantly reduce pollution levels. 
Antonio Palucci told the conference Thursday that he was confident the new system, which is expected to be operational at the end of 2014, would curb the dust, humidity, and carbon dioxide that are dulling Michelangelo's frescoed masterpiece. But if the new system doesn't work, he says he would be forced to impose the, quote, painful solution of limiting visitors. Some 5.5 million people are expected to visit the Vatican Museums this year. During high season, 20,000 people a day enter the intimate Sistine Chapel, which was last restored in the 1990s. 20,000 people a day walk through to look at Michelangelo's masterpiece. And if they have to limit, they will. Okay, moving on to number eight, Filippo Mazzai. You've never heard of him. You have no idea who he is, and why is he included in the Italian 100? Well, basically, the five most famous words in American history, all men are created equal, it came from him. Wait a minute. Thomas Jefferson wrote that. No, Thomas Jefferson got it from Filippo Mazzai. Filippo Mazzai was a physician. Uh, he practiced in Turkey. Then he moved to London, where he was a merchant. And guess what he sold? Olive oil, wine, and cheese. Okay. And in 1770, he ran into Benjamin Franklin. Ben, how are you? Ben says, listen you should come and move to America. Long story short, he did. And he bought a house next to Thomas Jefferson. Became very good friends. He did uh, bot botanical experiments where he was trying, he brought cuttings from England of trees and fruits and plants and wanted to plant them in U.S. soil to see how they would grow, if they would thrive, if they would wither, whatever. Um, so he came here and he lived and he became very good friends with Thomas Jefferson. He began writing for the Virginia Gazette, local newspaper, in Italian that Jefferson would translate. And his byline was furioso, you know, like terribilita, Michelangelo. Italians with their passion, he had to be furious. You know, his byline was, I am furioso, I am passionate. And ultimately, what he wrote was, and I'll read it to you, all men are by nature equally free and independent. Each equality is necessary in order to create a free government. All men must be equal to each other in natural law. Jefferson read that and reproduced it verbatim in the Bill of Rights he was writing for the Virginia Constitution. When he started writing the Declaration, he tightened it, edited it down to all men are created equal. That concept came from an Italian. Now, this begs the question, would Jefferson have come up with the notion on his own? Thomas Jefferson was a genius of the highest level. Almost the natural progression of thinking about people in a society, particularly a free society, would be to jump to the conclusion that we're all equal. But. Mazai, Filippo Mazai, did the heavy lifting, wrote it, actually came up with the concept, put it in writing, and that's where Jefferson got it for the Declaration of Independence. In 1776, he moved back to um, England, uh, Mazai, and spent his retirement years writing a four-volume history of the 13 colonies. This is an Italian who moved here to do botany experiments, who wrote and whose writing changed and defined America. And he went back home. Did he write a history of Italy or England or even Turkey where he practiced medicine? No. He wrote a four-volume history of the 13 colonies of the United States. So Filippo Mazzai is one of the most important Italians in terms of
America defining itself. In terms of verbalizing the American identity, Mazai gave Jefferson that kernel of inspiration that ultimately resulted in all men are created equal. Okay? All right, that's Mazai. Moving on. We're running out of time, so I'll go a little quicker. Torricelli, um, Evangelista Torricelli. Um, this guy, he died when he was 39 years old after inventing something that ultimately allowed us to invent meteorology. Basically, Torricelli allows you to watch the Weather Channel 24 hours a day because he invented the barometer. The barometer, prior to the barometer and its understanding of how air pressure can affect climate and weather patterns, weather was not predicted, it was speculated. Aristotle wrote a book called Meteorologica in 300 BC and it was a lot of guessing jumping to conclusions that if it rained and then the sun came out and there was thunder, that's a pattern that can be identified. It was purely speculative. Torricelli essentially created the first device that allowed the progression of the science. So again, we're talking influence. Without the barometer, where would influence, what, how would it, would it have gotten in, invented anyway? Probably just the way with the Da Vinci stuff. But he's the one who did it, and he died at a very young age of 39. Um, and just as an, an aside, when these, these people, these men and women who make these enormous achievements and die at a very young age, to me, that's very impressive. And you know what I tell my students all the time? Just remember that when the Beatles ended, Paul McCartney was 26 years old. 26, and he had already invented, performed, recorded, changed popular music as the Beatles, and then he was done. Retired, well, he didn't retire from music, but the point is, the band that defined him ended, and he was already, and he was only 26. Really, what's next on the agenda? So I'm always advising students that you're, never, you're not too young to make enormous world-changing decisions and accomplishments in your life. Because we have the historical record of people who have done exactly that. 26? I didn't know my name when I was 26, let alone having invented something that changed music for all time. Okay? So Torricelli invented the barometer. Uh, basically eliminated the need for weather speculation. Okay? Um, that's basically what I want you to know about him, so let's move on to Fibonacci. Fibonacci, Fibonacci introduced Arabic notation to the world. What's Arabic notation? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. Prior to him introducing that in 11, well, he was born in 1170. Um, everything was done with Roman numerals. Now, Roman numerals, you know, X, V, I, M, C, that's sort of usable for adding and subtracting. Sort of. It's still a pain. Try multiplying or dividing using Roman numerals. Your head will explode. <laughs> because it's literally almost an impossibility. And he discovered the one through zero, which also includes the concept of zero, which Roman numerals don't have, and place value. Depending on where the decimal point is determines value, which Roman numerals doesn't have. And he changed commerce and business and mathematics for all time. He's also the one who came up, who discovered what's called the golden mean, okay? The golden mean, M-E-A-N. And you ever see the inside of like a, a shell? 
that has the perfect spiral pattern, seashells, and you see it in plants and in flowers sometimes. That's called the golden mean. And what it is is a precise ratio of 0.618. And how do you get that ratio? He discovered that if you add two numbers in a row, 2 plus 3 equals 5. 5 plus 3 equals 8. 8 plus 5 equals 13. 13 plus 8 equals 21. If you keep adding together the prior two numbers, that's called the Fibonacci sequence, the ratio is always 0.618, and it can be used as a, an architectural tool, a design tool, and even more beautifully, it exists in nature. He discovered it. So Fibonacci changed commerce, he changed numerical notation, he changed business, he changed commerce, he changed mathematics, as well as giving us the identity of that ratio, which allows us to design accordingly and also see in nature that this ratio is a real thing that came into being Darwinianly from evolution, we don't know but he's the one who discovered it. Volta. Alessandro Volta was born in 1745. I'll make it quick for him. Essentially, every one of you has a phone on you, which would not exist without Volta because he invented the battery. He's the guy who came up with the notion of stored energy. He called it a voltaic pile because it was basically stacks of metal in a saline solution with chemicals and long story short it keeps energy stored within a portable thing and that evolved again influence he launched the development of the portable energy source now he's down he's number five Marconi is number three because portable energy is just a notch or two less important than wireless communication, which I'm now going to talk about when we get to Marconi. Um, but Volta understood and realized the importance of having portable energy sources that could be limitless depending on the size of the device. He died when he was 82 years old. Um, see if there's anything really interesting about him. He was 82. He lived to 82. You know, it's interesting how all these people before modern medicine lived into their 80s without, you know, uh, sterilization and antibiotics. And yeah, people died young, but Michelangelo was 89 years old. And you're telling me he never got a cut that got infected, that killed, turned into sepsis and killed him. That's amazing. It's unbelievable. It makes us wonder about our own health care these days, doesn't it? Okay, so there is a museum in his hometown called the uh, Museo Alessandro Volta in Como, Italy, dedicated to their native son, okay? Moving on is Enrico Fermi. Again, he died when he was 53. 53 today is just so young, and yet he changed the planet. How? He developed nuclear power and the nuclear bomb. Talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. He was able to launch nuclear power as well as allow the development of the nuclear bomb. Albert Einstein wrote a letter to FDR in 1939, and here's what he said. Some recent work by Enrico Fermi, which has been communicated to me in manuscript, leads me to expect that the element uranium may be turned into a new and important source of energy in the near future. Certain aspects of the situation which has arisen seem to call for watchfulness, and if necessary, quick action on the part of your administration. In the course of the last four months, it has been made almost certain that it may become possible to set up a nuclear chain reaction in a large mass of uranium by which vast amounts of power and large quantities of radium-like elements, radiation, would be generated. Here's the kicker. This new phenomenon 
would lead also to the construction of bombs. And that is Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So Enrico Fermi has a dual burden in history. He gave us, I mean, there are towns, Chicago, Toledo, Virginia Beach, Omaha, and Newark generate between 45 and 75% of their electricity from nuclear power. 75%. I'm hearing France is close to 100% nuclear power. We still have a problem with the radioactive waste disposal, but we'll solve that. We always do. We'll come up with a solution. But he was the one who came up with the knowledge, the research, and the effort to create nuclear power and the nuclear bomb. Talk about influence. That's why he's number three, number four. And that brings us to Guglielmo Marconi, who is number three. Again, you all got your phones, right? Without Marconi, you wouldn't have them because he came up with wireless communication. And the first thing he transmitted, the first thing he transmitted in 1901, first message ever transmitted by radio, the letter S. <laughs> That's what he sent. And it was received successfully. Wireless communication. In fact, Dr. Hart, um, who was my consultant, I told you, he works at Southern, he said something about um, how radio is more important, yeah, more important than the telephone. Why? Here's what he had to say. Radio is plainly a more important invention than telephone. Since a message sent by telephone might be sent by radio instead, whereas radio messages can be sent to places that cannot be reached by telephone. So the invention of radio and wireless communications changed communication for all time all over the world. And in fact, here's a related Titanic story. The telegraph room on the Titanic, they weren't called telegraphs, they were called Marconigrams. Because believe it or not, the Titanic rented out the telegraph room. The Marconi room on the Titanic was leased by the Marconi company and Marconi himself got all the money for messages sent and received to the Titanic. So it was not owned by the White Star Line, the owners of the Titanic. It was like, you know, those when you have a shoe franchise in the mall, they rent space and they sell shoes. The Marconi room, although the guys, the operators, did have to answer to Captain Smith. But they didn't work. They were not sailors and they did not work for the White Star Line. A lot of people don't, aren't aware of that. And they were called Marconi Grams. And believe me, the people who sent them, only the first class passengers could afford them. And basically what they sent was, oh, what a wonderful ship. Can't wait to see you. Having a wonderful time. And those cost a fortune. That's why many of the iceberg warning messages were not received, because the crew the Marconi operators were too busy sending out messages to their friends and relatives in New York telling them how beautiful Titanic was and that, you know, it's a wonderful ship and I can't wait to see you. So, so Marconi have a role in the sinking of the Titanic? <laughs> well, you know, my thesis regarding Titanic and it's, it's involving all accidents is that human er when human error combines with design error, the result is often catastrophe. And the Titanic sank because of design error and human error in unimaginable degrees. A lot of problems with those ships. All of both of the three sisters, they were called back to be retrofitted after she sank. So that kind of tells you what the company was thinking. Uh, number two is Christopher Columbus. Now, Christopher Columbus was, and this, this goes against the myth, he was a monster. Christopher Columbus was a slave trader. He was a sadist. He would have his crew 
chop children in half to test the sharpness of their swords. If the Indians which he enslaved to dig for gold didn't move fast enough, he'd chop their hands off and make them wear them around his neck. He was a monster. But, go back to my thesis about influence. He opened the West to European expansion and exploration. 500 years ago, the Norse, a, a Norse camp had been set up. Native Americans had been on the continent for 14,000 years. He didn't discover anything. What he did was find a route that allowed a simple exploration of the continent. And talk about influence. The end result is the America that we know. Because European expansion came in, all of Europe fought, Spain, France, we all, they all fought for parts of America. And he was also a slaughterer. One of the worst things about Columbus, when he discovered in the Bahamas, there were three million people, three million Native Americans there. Within two years, it was down to 60,000. Because he had killed or worked to death the majority of the population. So these are things you don't learn in school. You know, sea of red, blah, blah, blue, Columbus sailed, the ocean blue, whatever that little limerick is. Bottom line is that he was, in fact, his atrocities were so bad that one of the, one, during one of his trips back to Spain, they imprisoned him for war crimes, what would be considered war crimes today, because they had heard what he had done. But he opened this continent to European expansion and exploration, which is one of the most important and influential developments of the last thousand years. So he's ranked very, very high because the end result of his first trip is us. Which brings us to the number one Italian of all time. And frankly, in this day and age of elitism regarding science, Galileo should be worshipped. Galileo invented the scientific method. He invented the telescope, but he also invented the scientific method. Everybody know what the scientific method is? It's essentially theory, come up with a theory, observe, do experiments, do repeat the experiments, come up with a conclusion known as the final theory, the theory of gravity, the theory of evolution. Theory in this context means scientific principle that has been proven by repeatable experiments. That's the key. If I do something and I come to a conclusion and I give you my data and you do the same experiment and you get a different result, cannot be accepted. Galileo insisted it must be identical results and that's known as the scientific method. And without it, we would be living in the dark ages. Would someone else have come up with it? Again, probably. But Galileo was the one who insisted that science evolve. He's the one who his writings set the stage for any and all scientific developments and inventions and conclusions and theories of the last 500 years. So to me, inventing the scientific method is the single most important act by an Italian in world history. Thus, he's number one, Galileo Galilei. So um, it's, it's 3 o'clock, so I'm, I'll wrap it up. Any questions? Yes. Um, I just heard that when you say Christopher Columbus um, sailed into America, he thought he landed in India. That's why he yeah. thought everyone. Exactly. And in fact, you know, it's an interesting question because when I was writing the Native American history book and I was working with Dorothy, who's a Choctaw, I had to ask her, I said, how do you want to be addressed slash described? I said, because today Native Americans 
want to be called Native Americans. They're not from India. So it's a sensitive thing. And she said, I work for the a department of the Smithsonian called the Indian Reclamation Department. He says, honestly, the educated Native Americans were past it. We know we're not from India, but we also know that colloquially, culture has defined us by that term. So the majority of us don't take offense. I said, well, how should I address them in the book? She said, by tribe. Uh, well. He is a Cherokee. He is a Choctaw. He is not an Indian. He is not, even Native American to, the, to her was too vague. She said, we want to be known by what you would call our ethnicity, but to us is our tribe. So our tribes are our ethnic background. That's how we want to be addressed. So yeah, you're right though. That's exactly right. Yes, ma'am. Um, why do you think that Da Vinci didn't do like his experiment, his invent, like what did, why, why he, he left he stuff uncomplete and completed? Why, ask any writer why they put aside a book. I've got unfinished stuff. Ask me the same question. Why didn't you finish it? I don't know. I just wasn't inspired. I just wasn't interested. He probably got bored. Um, all the people that you mentioned here, yeah, it's undeniable. They're all very influential. But um, they all seem to have some sort of, they all seem to sort of have been uh, backed up by a higher authority. Mm -hmm. um, would they have been possible to achieve the same thing if they had Without sponsors? Yeah. Well, Good question. Because you're talking about financial hire. Financial, yeah, basically. Well, pretty, yeah, but that was it. This uh, many of them were from an era in which governments sponsored artists as an important part of society. So would. But then again, think of it like this: Da Vinci was hired to paint the Mona Lisa by a rich patron. Michelangelo was hired. So it really is kind of like any situation that we're in today. Somebody says to you, can you do this? And you can. I'll pay you this and you accept. In a way, you're being sponsored by the person hiring you. So it was very similar back then, too. And, and the problem, though, is artists had to constantly fight for work. In fact, the movie The Girl with the Pearl Earring about Vermeer, um, where the son-in-law, the painter who did the girl with the pearl earring, his struggle to constantly find work, sponsored work from rich patrons, that was endemic to the era all the way up through them being able to support themselves. But even today, it's the same thing. Well, I, I was thinking more of the lines of, especially seeing after the, all these pictures, like, um, they all seemed pretty prestigious. They didn't really seem... Yeah, they didn't really seem ordinary. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but could it be that their accomplishments now, we now perceive them as prestigious? When back then, Da Vinci was a, another artist. Many people recognized his genius, but then when you move up into like Volta, these were people who were just working at their job. Discovering this, experimenting with this, working on that, trying to make a living, going bankrupt, some of them. Uh, and then when we move up into the modern age, Marconi, he started a company. Fermi worked for a university. You know, so it's, it's, um, it's a combination of, of freelancing and sponsorship, I would guess you would describe it. So, sir. Who would you say is the most influential Italian of our lifetime? Like you know, that's a, years. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. In fact, um, when the paperback of this book came out, um, they said you have to cut number 100. And no, it's different now. Number 100 in the hardcover was Madonna. Because she had a massive influence on fashion, music videos, popular music, uh, culture. She changed culture with her, her sensibility. Um, and I said, okay, well, who do you want for they want Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani? So, you know, th there's so many people out there today. Um, believe it or not, De Niro and Pacino are considered major influences on cinema. So I guess the, the answer to your question is, which category? Because in science, it would be 
so and so. In film, it would be this. In writing, it would be probably Italo Calvino, who's on my list, but he's of the modern era and he changed literature, very postmodern. Yes? Um, do we know why Torricelli died so young? You know something? Um, cavemen died because of their teeth. Yeah. Because they ended up with heart problems from gingivitis. So who knows? He probably got an infection that turned, that today we'd knock out with an antibiotic, but back then his immune system wasn't strong enough and he probably just died. So many died very young and a lot of it was due to improper hygiene, lack of antibiotics, infections that wouldn't heal, as well as diseases that they didn't know, recognize as diabetes, kidney failure, heart trouble, all those things weren't treated. So he could have had, who knows, I'm sure it's out there somewhere, um, but I don't know, I don't know the exact reason. What should you think was the most interesting to you? To me? In the top 10 or in the top 100? Um, 100. In the top 100, I'll tell you the truth, I loved writing the Robert De Niro and Al Pacino chapters, only because I love movies. Um, I think they're both brilliant. I write about film. So in terms of pure enjoyment, that chapter was great. The Italo Calvino chapter, the Italian novelist, that gave me a chance to read some things of his that I had never seen before, and it just blew me away. So I, I really got a lot out of that chapter. The bulk of the rest of the list was just straightforward research. What did they do? Although I really liked Guido of Arezzo. He invented musical notation. I play piano, I was in bands. So without him, we wouldn't have sheet music. We wouldn't have the scales. And so that was a lot of fun. That was, that was a big one. So, ma'am. Uh, Say again? Who discovered Da Vinci's? Yeah, like, did da Vinci, like, publish his notebooks no. His no, in fact, the notebooks weren't discovered until well after his death. So my thinking is that in a studio like, of, like someone of Da Vinci's, can you imagine the papers, the books, the canvases? The, the, the folios, the, the things that, I'll bet his family and his scholars who were studying him <laughs> just were overwhelmed by what they found until they came across these notebooks and in them were these phenomenal illustrations and so forth. So I'm sure it was part of a process that often happens when someone of pre great prestige dies and then the survivors are tasked with identifying and, and unearthing their private writings and studios. In fact, I don't know if you've heard, but J.D. Salinger, mm -hmm. he had five novels yeah. in a yeah, bank yeah. Yeah. that we finally found out exist and that are going to be published. Who knows what, what's out there? And in fact, I told you, I've written about Stephen King. I know for a fact, he helped me with my first two books that I wrote about him. And I know for a fact, he's got unfinished stuff in drawers and in, in cardboard storage boxes in, in the attic, in his Bangor house and in his desks and in uh, everywhere. He's got a safe with things from writings from his childhood in there. So I just think it's a process and, and that's why I'm kind of cleaning my office out at, at this point. Um, I don't know how true this is, but I've heard like that Michelangelo wasn't their first pick to do the Sixteen Chapel. Is that true or not true? I had not read that. Okay. You may be right. I don't know. I, I'd know this. I'd have to see the source. Yeah. Um, but I had, I read my research showed that he was asked oh, and okay. accepted and the, a contract was drawn up. But maybe they Maybe there was a conversation about getting somebody else. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a book written that's dedicated to Galileo? Or no? That what? That's dedicated to Galileo. The whole like. No, I dedicated the Italian 100 to my mother and father. No, I'm saying like, do you have a book that's written completely about like the subject Galileo? Oh, in the. Person? Are there books? Have you written one? Oh no. No, no, I have not written solely about Galileo. I've written about Woody Allen and Robin Williams. <laughs> um, but no, I haven't done a, a full-blown bio or, or a look at Galileo, no. In fact, 
other than Pacino and De Niro, once I was done with this book, I, I, I mentioned this, I wanted to move on. You know, like my Titanic book, we were talking about this earlier. People, when you do a book with as a specific a focus as my books are, you come across fans, obsessive compulsive freaks who will not focus on anything but that subject. And so I've met many people, like with Titanic, where they say, you know, oh, I just heard that one of the rivets had an alloy compound in it that was unlikely to have occurred in 19... And I said, did you see that? And I said, no. And I have to explain, I, I want to move on. I'm writing three other books now. And to me, when I finish a book, you know, it's like these actors who never watch the movie they're in, or musicians who finish an album and never listen to it again, mainly because you might find fault with it, which I would definitely, if I look at some of my books, the majority of them I'm very pleased with, but I could edit a little bit, you know, after 20 years. I could say, oh, I could do that a little differently. But basically, I just try and get away from the subject, so. Did you ever get asked about the Da Vinci Code because you're top 100 talent book? I cut. I shut them down immediately. By I haven't read it. <laughs> I saw the movie, but I haven't. I haven't read it. You know. And so I say, yeah. And and frankly, you know, it's fiction. Yeah. It's fiction, and fiction should not be discussed on the, in the same arena as nonfiction about an historical character. And this is a problem. People read the Da Vinci Code, they think it's real. And they want to. Uh, they ask me when it does come up, "What'd you think of the divinity? Is that true that he did this and that this happened and that there was a machine with the code and the numbers and all that?" I don't know. I haven't read it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> want to talk about Titanic? Yeah. You know, and I move on. So, anyone else? Yes. Uh, what's your take on the speculation that Michelangelo had Asperger's syndrome? Did you find any research that? It would not surprise me if the vast majority of those people had Asperger's because the level of commitment and obsession with their and the focus on their work is very similar to what we describe for the symptoms of Asperger's today. So it would not surprise me in the least. But just remember that speculating on illnesses of long dead historical figures without proof. You know, this happened when I was doing the book, one of the president's books about Zachary Taylor. He was poisoned. This is what everybody said. He was poisoned. He was poisoned. He was poisoned. And it was a, a female professor who kept pushing that rumor that he didn't die from gastroenteritis. He died from being poisoned. She actually convinced the family to uh, bring up his remains and test him. He died from gastroenteritis. So everything that she was speculating was pure speculation without scientific fact. Once they tested him, his remains, they concluded, no, he did not have, he was not poisoned, nobody killed him. But the story is that he drank, he, it was sweltering hot in Washington, and Washington, D.C., and he believed, sometimes you gotta wonder how, uh, stupidity, you know, he believed that eating like two pounds of ice cold cherries and a gallon of cold milk would cool him off. It caused a rupture in his intestines and he died from a gastroenteritis stroke or whatever you would call it. He wasn't poisoned, but this professor convinced the family that he was and she was ultimately proven wrong and she, when asked about it, she was like, well, I'm still not convinced. I'm done with you then. <laughs> if science doesn't convince you, I have nowhere else to go. <laughs> if, if actual proof, concrete proof, doesn't convince you of something, I'm done with you because I have no, nothing else to say. Because once you, once you reject the science, there's no arguing with you. There's no discussion with you because anything you say, you are going to, it's, 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 a, it's a fallacy to take anything you say seriously because you're rejecting scientific proof. Like if I say to you, this is a chair, and you say, no, it's not. 
it's a bureau or it's 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 a stove and I say no here um, empirically in reality this is a chair and you reject that and say no it's a stove and I'm proving to you it's a chair but you're rejecting the proof because whatever reason okay why people reject evolution and everything else so, so. anybody else all right thank you all for coming there is uh, there are refreshments thank you Thank you. If anybody's interested in, a, in an Italian 100, see me and I can get one for you. Um, and there are refreshments uh, graciously provided by friends of the library. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.